Welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I am delighted that you decided to study God's Word with us today. I want to encourage you to go and take your Bibles out. We are going to go through God's Word verse by verse today. And I also want to invite you to share this with your friends and family and like this page. We want to get God's Word out around the world, changing lives one life at a time. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word is truth and that your Word has the power to change our lives. So Father, as we look into your Word, speak to our hearts and help this be a day where the truth changes our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Radiant Church. How was everyone? Awesome. Well, it is so good to have you in church today. Welcome to those watching online. Go ahead and turn to Nehemiah 1. And as you turn there, a little recap from last week, for those of you who weren't here, we talked about the vision of the church. And we, we revealed one word that kind of is going to be our theme for the year, and it's the word favor. Favor has five letters, and five is the number of grace in the Bible. And what we're declaring is that this is going to be a year to flow in God's favor. We believe that this church is going to experience great growth in discipleship and depth. We're going to see us reach more people in our community. Just in Buncombe County alone, we talked about last week, almost every day about 10 people die in Buncombe County, and that's a lot. I mean, you think about 10 people are going into eternity daily. So that puts an impetus on us to give every man, every woman, every student, every child a chance to hear the good news about Jesus Christ, which is the greatest message ever. So our vision is to get the good news out. And we want to get it out in our relationships, in our home, in our families, in the marketplace, in the corporate world. We want to get it out. So that, that's part of our vision of leading people from darkness into light. So we need to encourage you to pray and just continue to seek God as, as we flow in His favor. So as we get ready to read Nehemiah, a little background would help. I want you to picture this, a place that had walls broken down. Think about a ghost town. As we go through ghost towns, even in our society now, you've seen towns that have been run down, towns that don't look like they used to. And you go through these towns and you think, what happened? What was here prior to this? And that's the picture of Jerusalem. The, the idea of what happened, it goes back to around 586 B.C., about two to three million Jews were deported into places like Babylon. And it was just left, and the city was in ruins. And in time, they had sent about 50,000 Jews back, but that was a small percentage of the population. That's about 2% or so. And so they had rebuilt the temple, but the walls lay in ruin. And you're like, what's the big deal about walls? Well, a city that has no walls is like you having no door on your house. Can you imagine having no front door? Imagine who could come in, not just people that you don't want in, but animals and, you know, things that you're like, well, how did this get in here? Well, there's no door. Having no walls is like having a treasure chest with great valuables on the inside, but no lock. It would be easy to take those valuables. So Jerusalem has been without walls for about 140 years. And they, they tried to rebuild the walls previously, and it was unsuccessful. The king's like, no, nope, I, I hear these people are rebellious, so we're not going to do it. So in steps Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a man that's average. He's not a prophet. He's not a priest. He's not a king. He's not a ruler. He's a cupbearer. Now, before you think of cupbearer as a glorified butler, it's much more than that. A cupbearer was a confidant to the king. He would be someone that would taste the food and the beverage, the wine typically, and he would make sure it's not poison. So he had a very close relationship with the king. And because of that, he became kind of like a secret service agent, what we know today, that his goal was to protect the king, to make sure that no one took out the king's life. And that gave him such proximity to the king that now Nehemiah finds himself in a place to be a difference maker. And that's where we pick up in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. In Nehemiah 1, starting in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. 
It came to pass in the month of Chislev. Someone say Chislev. That is November, December, okay? We don't use the Jewish calendar unless you're Jewish, you know? It's like, what is, what is that? It's November, December. In the twelfth year, I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are, have left the city from captivity in the province there are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you have commanded your, mo your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though some of you are cast out to the furthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I was the king's cupbearer. May God bless his word. So today I want to give you three identities of being the difference maker. What does it mean to be a difference maker? Number one, the first identity is you have the change agent. A change agent is someone who's a difference maker is someone who seeks a solution to a pressing problem. So notice that Nehemiah was far removed from the problem, about 800 miles away. It'd be easy for him to say, yeah, this is a big issue, but, you know, it's someone in another country. It's someone in another life. Here I am. I've got it made in this posh palace. I, this, don't, let, let, let this not concern me. It's almost like when we see images of starving children in other countries, and they're like, that's a problem, but it's not here, right? It's so easy to dismiss this, but Nehemiah did not dismiss this. He heard about this problem. Hananiah came and said that the people of Israel were in great distress and reproach. Now, I find it interesting that Nehemiah's name means the Lord comforts, and it's kind of fascinating and somewhat prophetic that God would send the one whose name means the Lord comforts to comfort his people some 800 miles away. And some of you may be saying, well, you know, I can't make much of a difference. You know, I don't, I don't have great position. I don't have a place like Nehemiah. He at least had the king's ear. You know, I, I don't know what it's like to be a difference maker. What I want to say to you is if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, by default, you're a difference maker because Jesus changed the world. And you're like, oh, I'm not Jesus. I can't change the world. Do you not have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you? If you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, you are anointed and appointed to be a difference maker where you live, where you work, and in the circles where you touch. You are called to be a difference maker. You are called to tell people the night and day difference that God has made in your life. He's called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. You, my friend, are a difference maker. So we see Nehemiah 
realizing, okay, there's, there's this problem, but we got to seek a solution. And that brings us to truth number two. The second identity of the difference maker is the spiritual leader. A spiritual leader, it means this, a difference maker is someone who seeks God first before acting. So what does a spiritual leader do? They don't act first and then pray second. Look at verse four. It says, so when it was, I heard these words that I sat down and wept and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Even though Nehemiah's body was in the palace, his heart was with the people of God. Even though he was where he was in Susa, his heart was some 800 miles away in Jerusalem. And he remembered the walls that had been broken down. And as he heard about this, he was moved to action. And it reminds me of the psalmist in Psalm 137. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So that was Nehemiah. His heart was moved to where the people of God were. His heart was moved to the house of God. What about you? Are you moved to be with the people of God? Are you moved to be in God's house? You know, the psalmist said, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And you fast forward to the New Testament and the theme is still the same. We are the church. We are the called out ones. And church now is your, you are the church, right? Wherever you go, you carry the presence of God. But in the New Testament, it's the gathering of churches, the gathering of believers to worship. It doesn't matter if it's by the riverside or in a building. It's the people of God coming together for collective and corporate worship. And in the Old and New Testament, we see people that were really about the things of God. They scheduled and based their lives around They often made radical changes. Here you have Nehemiah in the posh palace of Susa. And he could have stayed there, had a great job, but he's like, listen, my heart is for the people of God. I am moved by what's going on in, in Jerusalem. So that brings up a thought that whenever you hear about a problem, you need to try to think of a solution, right? How many of you have people in your life that they're professional problem bringer uppers? Anybody? They see the problem, but they never or they seldom give a solution. What we can learn from Nehemiah is if you can think of a problem, you can pray through until you think of a solution. Now, there are three options when you think of a problem. The first option is to ignore it. The ignore it is you put it under the rug and it's like, it'll go away. If I don't think about it, I don't see it, right? Hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil. It's just going to go away, right? How many problems actually go away on their own? Very few. The second option is you blame others. Well, it's their fault, right? Just like Genesis 3. You know, Adam's like, what's going on? What have you done? It's the woman. Okay, Eve, what have you done? It's the snake, and the snake just slid, slid it out of there. It had no one to blame, right? So it's like we, we, we all practice the blame game. But if you blame someone, how does that solve the problem? The older I get, the longer I live, the more I realize this. When I was in my 20s, I often thought that everyone else is at blame. I was seldom the, at fault, right? And I, I got in my 30s, I'm like, well, maybe I'm 20% at fault. And now I'm like, you know what? I've got skin in the game. Be, with very few exceptions, I have some culpability with any problem that involves me. There are exceptions to the rule. Don't you say the same with your life? Or is your spouse always the one that's at fault, right? You're like, wow. So here's the thing. You can blame others. Or the third option is this. Do something about it. God brought this to my attention, therefore I will take action. And this is what Nehemiah did. When you look at this passage, he listened to the problem, and then he responded immediately by taking this problem to God. Notice in the Scripture, he wept before God. He prayed for many days. Scripture says that he deprived himself of food as he fasted. 
So friends, I just want to present this to you that God desires to do a work in you before He'll choose to do a work through you. I'll say that again. God desires to do a work in you before He will choose to do a work through you. A lot of us want God to do a great work in our lives, right? But are we taking the time to pray? Are we taking the time to seek God? Now, one of the things is we're now in day eight of our 10 days in prayer and fasting. Every year, God does something different. For me, it's been mental clarity. This has just been like, wow. I, it's almost like when your computer is slowed down and you do a defrag or you reboot it or you get a brand new computer, and it's like, this is so, so much different than the old computer. That's kind of what I've been experiencing this fast is clarity. So I just want to encourage you, right now as we pray, Right now, as we seek God, pray for clarity. God, what do you want me to do? There's this pressing problem. What do you want me to do? And I want to tell you, I have to go back in time. Some of you, this is before your time. But shortly after being installed as the 20th pastor of Dexter Alexander, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King, he delivered a sermon and the sermon, this is, by the way, November 1954. That's why I said some of this before your time. He delivered a sermon called Transform Nonconformist. And basically the theme of his sermon was, is so many Christians are like a thermometer. We just adjust to the temperature of the room. But we're not called to be thermometers. We're called to be thermostats. We're called to change the culture, to change the climate. We are called to be transform nonconformists. So there was someone that that sermon impacted. Fast forward a year later, the date was December 1st, 1955. There was a transform nonconformist who boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus just five blocks from the pulpit of Dr. Martin Luther King's sermon. And in that day of segregation, for those of us who didn't grow up, and it was a very unfortunate time, they they had different sections for different people. And the movement that they started was that God has created us equal. There's no one better than others. And we, we've got to not use violence, but we've got to stand on the biblical principles that we're all made in the image of God. So whenever this bus filled up, they asked this young lady in her 40s to move out of her section. She was in the colored section. There was a white man. They said, we want you to move out so he can have the seat. And Rosa Parks decided politely and pleasantly, I'm not going to move. Because she realized she was not a thermometer, she was a thermostat. God was going to use her to change the culture. And Rosa Parks, she got in trouble, but guess what? God began to move through that situation. They did a boycott that they were not going to ride these buses anymore, which affected the economy. And eventually this went to the court system. And it, it made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court thankfully decided that segregation was unconstitutional. Not only is it sinful, but it was unconstitutional. And that day, Rosa Park, she became a difference maker. And some of you are like, well, I'm not like Rosa. You know, like I, I, I'm just one person. But listen, you plus God is a majority. If you are standing on biblical principles, on God's word, and he's told you to be a difference maker. You don't have to be obnoxious. You don't have to be mean. You can be polite. You know, we are, we are peculiar people, but we don't have to be peculiar in the way of obnoxious. Peculiar means that we're different from the world. We are as different as light and darkness. So when I, when I read this story about Rosa Parks, it just inspires me that God likes to use ordinary people, ordinary people, to make extraordinary changes. Because if an ordinary people is surrendered to extraordinary God, you may not be able to change the whole world, but you can start with changing your world. Do I have some difference makers in the room? Amen. And that brings us to our third identity. The third identity of a difference maker is the prayer warrior. A difference maker is someone who realizes that true and lasting change comes through the power of prayer. Now, in verses 5 through 11, we'll cover this more in depth on Wednesday night, but I just want to give a broad overview of this. This is one of 12 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. So when you see how did Nehemiah change the world in 52 days, as we're going to see in the next few weeks, how did he do it? It started with prayer. 
So, there's seven principles I want to bring to you from Nehemiah, from this passage. Seven principles that if you apply it, it will drastically change your prayer life. So, this is great application from this chapter. Number one, prayer should begin with a vertical focus on who God is. Notice in verse 5, he says, I pray, Lord God of heaven. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, right? So, Nehemiah starts with this vertical focus. Because if you're down here on the earth and life is kind of de- boring, it's kind of depressing, and sometimes it's disturbing, there's problems all around you. If you, like, look at earthly stuff, you'll get discouraged. But if you go vertical and you see how great God is, and it's like, God, I want some of the heavenly reality to invade my situation. Second principle is thanksgiving should start your conversation with God. Well, what can we be thankful for? Notice what Nehemiah says about God. He says, oh, great and awesome God. Are you thankful for God's character that He is great? He is awesome. There's nothing He can't do. Start your prayer with thanksgiving. Instead, some of us have SOS prayers. Save our souls. God, help me with this. God, I'm going through this problem. And those prayers have their place. But the model prayer should be start with who God is and start with thanksgiving. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're starting with who God is. We're starting with thanksgiving. God, you're, you're great. Number three, remind God of his promises. God had promised to restore his people back to the land. And they had waited 70 years before this promise came to pass. But realize 70 years is like seven days. It's like seven minutes. It's very short in the eyes of God. So no matter how long it takes, keep reminding God. God doesn't forget His promises, but He loves it when His children remind Him, God, you promised this in your word. You promised this. Number four, ask God to act on your behalf. Nehemiah said, God, be responsive to my prayer. So whenever you pray, don't pray a doubtful prayer like you don't expect God to answer. Pray with this childlike faith that I believe my Father in heaven is going to answer this prayer if I pray according to His will. I'm not praying with doubt. James says don't doubt through your prayers. Don't be like this wave driven and tossed by the wind, but be someone that believes God, that God can do it. Number five, Confess any sins that are keeping you and others from experiencing God's promises. Notice Nehemiah said, we have sinned. He didn't pass the buck on others. They have sinned. He said, we. He put himself in the situation. He mentions we three times. So it's so easy to blame others. And it's so hard to take personal responsibility. But you know what? The Scripture says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. So Nehemiah confessed the sins, because sin is sometimes the barrier that keeps us from experiencing God's breakthrough. It's just like with my amazing children, I have two sitting on the front row. If there's something in their life that I knew, if, if, I, if I gave this blessing, they wouldn't be able to handle it. I'll hold it back until they're ready, right? Right? And the same is true with God. He's got blessings ready to release, but sometimes there's a sin that blockades that from coming. So we got to get sin out of the way so the flow of God's favor can continue to flow. Number six, remind God of His Word by repeating it back to Him. So if you look in verse 7 and following, he talks about what God told Moses. So what is he doing here? He's reminding God of His Word. God, you said this. Yes, if if we turn from you, you'll scatter us. But God, you said if we return to you, you'll gather us from either the furthest parts of the earth. So I would encourage you, the Bible is a book of promises. And if you will just read those promises, and the Bible says in Christ, the promises of God are yes and amen. Claim those promises that he has for his children. Number seven, ask God for favor and provision for the breakthrough. I love how Pastor Craig Rochelle summarizes this into this. He says, Nehemiah was an ordinary world changer because he did three things. He sat down to cry, he knelt down to pray, and he stood up to act. I'll say that again. He sat down to cry, he knelt down to pray, and then he stood up to act. 
So before you act, make sure that you've been in prayer. So Nehemiah went from the king's cupbearer to God's burden bearer. So what I'm trying to say is this. If you are an average, ordinary, everyday guy or girl, God can use you. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for surrendered people. And as you read through Scripture, you see David. David was a person after God's own heart. David became king, and he did great things. But remember, David had a lot of great mess-ups. He struggled with lust. He struggled with breaking God's commandments as he took someone's life. I mean, he, he did a lot of bad stuff, right? You fast forward to Samson. Samson felt the strength of God flowing through his human body. But yet Samson was naive, and he trusted in people that let him down. And eventually, his hair got cut off. You remember the story. He, he opened his heart up to people that took advantage of him. Samson had his own moral failings, and yet God used him. And we have to think in the New Testament, our classic example of Peter. Peter was not perfect. Peter often stuck his proverbial foot in his mouth. Peter was impulsive, but yet... Because Peter was surrendered even though he denied Christ three times, even though he cursed and said, I don't know the man, God used Peter to impact the world. Why? Not because Peter was perfect, but Peter was surrendered. So if you're here today and you're like, I'm not perfect, I got major issues, welcome to the club, right? God doesn't use perfect people, He uses surrendered people. The only perfect person was Jesus, and you and I are imperfect, and we need God to work through us. So let's review our three points as we bring this to a close. How can you and I be a difference maker? How can we change the world around us? We talked about the change agent. A change agent is someone who seeks a solution to a pressing problem. So if you're a professional problem bringer upper, turn that around and pray about the problems and ask God for a solution. It's been said, never present a problem without seeking to present a solution. Number two is a spiritual leader, a difference maker, someone who asks God first and seeks God first before acting. So many of us act first and then seek God later. God bless what I've already started. Number three, the prayer warrior, a difference maker, is someone that truly believes and realizes that true and lasting change only happens through the power of prayer. So how do we contextualize this. Well, let's throw the big idea on the screen. God likes to use ordinary people to be the difference maker in the ordinary lives. And I want to make it very applicable to you. So tomorrow you're like, I'm a difference maker, but how? Well, three applications that we talked about. Number one is to be a change agent in your spheres of influence. You may not have broken walls around your house or a broken fence, but there's broken people all around you. What can God do through you to impact the lives. What, what things are broken? And remember, even small acts of love and kindness can go a long ways. Number two, seek God before acting. This is an important and crucial step to make sure that your, what you're doing is in alignment with God's will. Because if you do something good, but it's not aligned with God's will, it may not have eternal significance. So make sure that you pray first before you act. And finally, embrace the power of prayer as your foundation. Realize what James says, that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So Nehemiah knelt down and prayed before he stood up to act. Friend, I just want to encourage you that you are the difference maker. You may just be ordinary and average, but God uses average, ordinary people to change the world as they surrender to Him. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I'm excited about this study of Nehemiah. I'm super excited. I can't wait for the next several weeks in this book. And God, I, I just want to come, first of all, confessing that I've not always been surrendered. I've not always presented a solution. I've not always prayed to God first before acting. And I'm sure there's many that would say the same. If that's you, just tell God you're sorry. Say, God, forgive me. And God, I surrender. Just go ahead and tell him, God, I surrender. 
As the music plays, I just want you to do business with God right where you're at. There may be someone here today that you're in a crisis. You're in a problem where it seems like there's no way to get out. And I just want you to say, God, you see where I'm at. You see what I'm going through. I pray that you would do something through me. But before you do something through me, do something in me, God. Do something in me that will eventually flow through me. As the believers continue to pray and do business, there may be one here today that God needs to do something in your heart for the first time. Every week we give you the chance, if you've never prayed to receive Christ, if you've never been born again, the gospel is the good news that Christ died for your sins and he rose that third day. So if you've never placed your faith in Jesus alone for salvation, not good works, not church attendance, not anything you could bring, but a heart of faith, I want you to say this prayer of faith. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, say this prayer, Jesus, I believe the good news. I believe that you came and lived the perfect life that I did not live, that I cannot live. You died on the cross in my place and for my sins. And Jesus, you rose that third day. So right now, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to save me. I pray that you would forgive me of all my sins. Make me brand new on the inside. And thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, let us know so we can give you some next steps. Father, thank you that you've called us to be difference makers. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name and all God's children said. Thank you so much for joining us today for Truth for Transformation. My prayer is that God's word resonates deep within your soul. My mission here at this ministry is to encourage and equip and empower you to reach your full God-given redemptive potential. If you would like to partner with this ministry, you can do so by going to our church website. That is radiant828.com. Our mission here is to get the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world in its various formats. We want to do this through preaching. We want to do this through writing books that are going to encourage people. And we want to do this through radio and television. So your partnership helps us to reach more lives. We hope that this was a blessing and we hope to see you next week.